Coming up on the Mobile Content Creators Show. How can different cameras or smaller cameras or mobile phones as cameras uh, transform you know, and enhance the way people are creating? So today's topic, creating the accessories to support this growing mobile content industry. Welcome to the Mobile Content Creators Show. If you're a mobile journalist, marketer, or creative who makes content on a mobile device or for mobile audiences, you're in the right place. Keeping you up to date with the fast-moving world of mobile, here's your host and mobile video specialist, Mark Egan. Hey, Mark Egan here, and apologies for not creating a podcast for a little while. I'd love to give you a really good excuse, but um, I've been in Cyprus and the west of Ireland and doing pretty much everything besides um, recording podcasts. So apologies for that, but we're back with a vengeance today. I'll be speaking to Josh from Padcaster. So uh, Padcaster obviously creates um, accessories, devices, so that you can put your iPad, iPhone, smartphone into one of theirs, add lights, microphones, whatever you want, put it on a tripod, so it's hugely useful. Um, Just a few quick uh, messages. Uh, Firstly, thanks to anybody who's um, dropped me a line, sent me a message. Um, I do appreciate those. And if you want to give me some feedback or suggest a guest or a topic, please tweet me at Mark Egan Video. It's, I'd love to hear from you. Um, so what do you want to hear? Who do you want to hear from? And I'll get in touch with them and uh, see if I can sort that out for you. Um, and the other thing to say is I am putting this podcast on YouTube and Facebook, but I'm no longer going to record the video just because creating these massive video files just for talking heads um, didn't seem to make a lot of sense when most people, even if they watch on YouTube, just hit play and listen to the audio. So um, to sort of speed up the workflow to get more podcasts out, um, I'll be uploading them, but it really just be the audio with a graphic. But um, so that's enough from me. Um, as I said, please get in touch, but let's crack on with today's episode. Well, today I'm joined from New York by Josh Apeter, who's the founder and CEO, I guess, of a uh, Padcaster. And of course, Padcaster is... Um, provides accessories for iPhones, iPads, various smartphones and mobile devices so you can shoot fantastic video and add all the accessories. So uh, Josh, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Well, um, now I've read up a bit about you before um, I spoke to you and um, you know, I knew that you had a filmmaking background, but I know that lots of people just say, you know, I'm a filmmaker, whether it's just, uh, you know, they're not really making many films or just to pick up girls, whatever the reason. But you genuinely are a filmmaker. I mean, tell us a bit about your background. OK, well, it's you know, I, I refer to my filmmaking as almost an illness. Um, it's incurable. And I, um, I it started when I was around 12 years old. Uh, you know, the story goes with a lot of people. My dad's Super 8 camera found its way into my hands and started making short films and um and 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 there was luckily a class in my high school that was a super eight film class that uh, i got to you know work through more ideas the teacher was showing us citizen kane and eraser head and we were analyzing these films when we were you know 16 years old 17 years old um and it grew from there i went to school and did fine arts classes and film and then went to nyu graduate film school and and it really turned on there and um you know, ended up um, making a few feature films. And um, now, as time permits, I'm writing features to make and making short films to keep the muscles worked out. But it sounds like you're being a little bit modest because there was a few kind of name dropping moments, the opportunities that you missed there. So go ahead. I give you permission. Um, Well, I, you know, my then girlfriend's roommate was dating Edward Norton, who ended up in a short that I did at NYU. Um, this was before he was a SAG actor. And this is really, this was 92, 93. Um, and, uh, you know, he went from there. We had our big brat party and he went off to L.A. to bang down some doors and get his first uh, breakout role in Primal Fear. So that turned into a, you know, people saw it because of him. Um, but, you know, I really, I, I th- always thought of it as an ensemble piece. And, um, you know, I, I was just glad that it got more exposure because, you know, it had that hook. Um, but that, I think that's the only name to drop, right? I mean, uh, there have to be. I know. I think he won a couple of awards and things, but I, um, <laughs> I, I'll let you off. Just, just we, we know that you've got a filmmaking background and you know what you're doing and, and you single handedly made it, made Edward Norton's career. OK, so <laughs> we've, we've, we've got that far. Um, so, I mean, it's a bit of a journey from that to what you're doing now. So what you know, you, you're out there, you're you're writing, you're directing, you're making um sort of shorts um how do you get from there to where you are now 
Well, it's, you know, the thing, the film that he was in, um, when I was at NYU, I became a big a sort of like a, you know, a, 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 a Robert Altman uh, you know, enthusiast, I would say. I loved his work style, his highly improvisational, you know, he was just, he just had a different outlook on films. I, I, in high school, I was very much about um, aesthetics and, you know, um, the formalist structure and looking at Hitchcock and planning everything out. And then Altman sort of blew that the doors off. And certainly Cassavetes uh, was very influential just in terms of the power of the actor. And at NYU, the, 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 the biggest budgetary constraint was the film stock, which to me seemed like that was ridiculous that of all things to hold you back from, you know, experimenting with actors and, and really finding that moment, it shouldn't be the cost of the film. So, um, they had their first beta cam SP rigs coming in at the time. And I pitched to the, to the, to the faculty, can I shoot this film on video? And knowing you know, that they just got their first avid at the time that I would have to learn that, which I thought was kind of a cool thing. Cause you know, it was a totally new technology. I said, well, look, if I can shoot on beta, I can shoot I can shoot 10 times as much and it costs me 10 times less. And I think that was maybe the beginning of me looking at a marriage of technology and creativity as a way to, you know, uh, I don't know, overcome some obstacles or face different challenges that, that are different to different filmmakers. Certainly independent filmmakers are always worried about budgets. And if shooting digital or shooting video um, can help, you achieve a vision and not compromise it. And I think beta came very close to actually compromising it because it was very clumsy and uh, didn't look quite as good. Um, but um, you know, I think that was the beginning of me saying, you know, how can different cameras or smaller cameras or mobile phones as cameras uh, transform, you know, and enhance the way people are creating? Okay. Now, um, obviously, you had that moment where you saw. The efficiencies of you know shooting on smartphones on tablets and everything um and like many other people you thought you know what it'd be really cool if you could you know add a mic here or put a light there or whatever now most people then you know go back to doing whatever they're doing and leave it for somebody else to do um how difficult or how which moment did you think you know what actually i think i might throw myself into this 100 percent well um it, you know it, it was at nab uh, in las vegas i think in 20 I want to say 2010, whenever the iPad 2 came out, it was a week after that, I bought it because it had a camera in it, and that was different than the iPad. The first iPad didn't. Um, and so with a camera in the iPad and then the iMovie, you know, loaded on there for free, it certainly was worth experimenting with, um, you know, in terms of doing long-form work or other sort of, you know, advanced mobile journalism, things like that hadn't really been thought of. But for short work, like really short, almost video Twitter-like pieces it was it was a really beautiful application because it was this sort of vertically integrated production and distribution system all in one um and i got a lot of encouragement just from the local community i, I was the education head of the new york final cut pro user group uh, um years ago and so i came back from nab and did a presentation like a post show wrap up and showed them a prototype of this this gizmo and you could tell people were you know were kind of like what the hell is that and in a good way and that was, you know, I think that helped sort of, you know, encourage me. Uh, also, my father's background is in, is in engineering. And um, I think he always supported me as a filmmaker, but never quite understood it as a creative endeavor. And so this was a really interesting marriage of, you know, his background and my background. And I think that also helped me say, like, I think this is a this is a synthesis of the things that I love to do and that, um, you know, that he loved. So um, those things together really propelled it forward. And how hard is it to actually do to sort of um, think, you know what, I would like a frame around this iPad and the ability to put a few things on the top um, uh, to take that idea and actually get it manufactured. Um, how, how what's that process like? Well, if you're just going to the frame store in the East Village and asking them if they can put a picture frame on an iPad, which I did. That's pretty easy. They actually said, they said, oddly enough, you're not the first person to ask us to do this. Oh, really? Yeah. And so the first, like one of the first prototypes was literally a, a, a metal picture frame um, that was measured probably in it, you know, and, and it just fit around it. It was, I had to drill holes in it for uh, the accessories, but it was, it worked. Um, there was a, an aluminum contractor clipboard that sort of was one. But then, you know, being that my father was in engineering and um, material handling, he knew engineers that I got to, you know, the, uh, the benefit of, and I still work with um, one of them, 
who, you know, on nights and weekends would tinker around and, and we'd sketch out ideas and, and do them. So on that, in that sense, the process was probably easier for me because I had access to people who could take something that I scribbled on a napkin and really turn it into, you know, something in a 3D AutoCAD space and then model it and build it. So, um, you know, it was it was in that sense, it was really very interesting to me and it wasn't really discouraging at all. And who picked it up? You know, you produce this thing. Hey, you, you know, you can turn your iPad into a proper filmmaking kit. Who are the people who jumped at it? Well, the f- it's very interesting because the early, you know, it was designed really for, you know, gearheads and hobbyists, video bloggers and things like that. And I think, you know, now looking at it, it's very much an education specific uh, tool. It's really um, blown up in education. Um, but the first people to pick it up in a serious way were um, two companies, uh, B&H Photo, and I had a prior yeah. relationship with them because I, I also own a, a film editing school, and they sold our training as a voucher for people when they bought edit systems there. They would then say, hey, do you want some training in, in Premiere or Final Cut or something and sell a weekend class or something? And so they knew me, and when I went in with this, they said, yeah, let's give it a try. So um, you know, there was that, the, you know, sort of, uh, again, it was, it was, uh, this was the only thing I've ever done where going further was met with, you know, um, it was not met with resistance that you had to push through. It was more, you know, met with encouragement at every step. And I said, well, if, if that's the way this is going to go, I'm going to keep going with it. That's a good sign. Yeah. And you mentioned education and what kind of, how are people are using it in education? I mean, it's amazing. There are journalism schools. I mean, you probably know of two, uh, you know, big one being SUNY Stony Brook in Long Island that's using it, basically re- using it as a, as a proxy satellite truck. So their student news crews will use a Wi-Fi hotspot in their pocket and an iPad and Skype to two-way, um, you know, into the anchor desk and do their, you know, all of their news shows. Their live correspondents are basically on iPads and with Skype. Um, other schools in K through 12 are using it for their morning announcements and morning news programs that are all student run and replacing those really old, you know, giant cameras with coaxial cables going into the walls with essentially, you know, custom fit, almost like, um, you know, Apple TV backends where they can have their morning news programs wirelessly streamed to every, you know, whiteboard in the school. And it comes on a little channel that you can surf through and every program that they record is archived. And I mean, it's really amazing to see how much has, has developed in the last three, four years. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you're like me, that sometimes you go into um, educational establishments and uh, you get quite jealous of people who are young, just starting everything they were able to do at that age. Whereas, um, you know, I remember coming into the TV industry, you know, to get anywhere near an edit suite or a camera was a really hard thing to do. Um, whereas now it's just the doors open for them. Oh, yeah, it's it's yeah. amazing the kind of access. And the, I mean, so the barrier of entry is, is so much lower now. Um, when, you know, when we talk to educators and tell them what it would cost to, you know, we have a product called the Padcaster Studio and it's a $650 product that includes everything. And when we say, you know, it's, you know, the discount price is like a 600 and we say six, they say 6,000 and we, they can't believe that there's not an extra zero on the number. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that helps. You could always put that extra zero on if you like, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that's when, you know, you've undercharged them. Well, you know, it's... It, I'd rather they buy more of them and give more access to more people and be happy with that price, um, you know, than than have them say, "Oh, well, geez, we could buy a TriCaster," uh, because I want mm-hmm. them to understand that they don't need a TriCaster necessarily. They can do everything that that thing does, and they can actually do it without any wires. And yeah. um, and the, the kids love it; they get it. it the, the interface is so intuitive that it's. Um, you know, this is much easier to teach than just going through some lengthy manual uh, and explaining all the different buttons. And just imagine, you know, the, the glee that some student goes through something like live to air and just gets the, gets what it does instantly. And, you know, I know the answer to this, but I'll throw the question to you. One of the things I do here is um, that idea that, um, you know, with something like a podcaster, um, you add on your light and your microphones and everything else. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And people say, we've lost the mobility. You've, um, you know, you may as well just be using a big camera because you've made it so huge with all these add-ons. Um, you've lost the sort of fun bit of it being small and mobile. Uh, what do you say to that? 
Well, everything that we sell fits into a backpack. So I think it still has a lot to, you know, we we did a live broadcast in Philadelphia once and it was for a professional football team and our equipment all fit into one case. And this nor- this news crew came to cover it also. And they had six or seven giant road cases and they couldn't, they didn't even understand what we were doing. So I still think comparatively it's very portable, um, you know, and, and our, you know, it's a compromise because our lights aren't very big. So there are these little LEDs that you've seen all over the place. Mm. Um, but if you want to do professional lighting, a little, you know, you know, two by four LED isn't really going to do that. So, you know, I don't want people to misunderstand that, oh, I can light an interview with one, you know, little 36 bank LED. It's um, it's more complicated than that. And and so on, you know, on some level, it's only as portable as what you're trying to achieve. Um and I think the big advantage of using a device like an iPad or an iPhone is the connectivity, the fact that it actually can communicate with the outside world, especially for journalism. I mean, you know, the idea that you don't have to then upload the footage to, you know, a newsroom where they cut it together and do what they do. And, you know, it really becomes something very, you know, um, instant. And, um, you know, I think in terms of I think it's worth the extra lights and mics and things that maybe – um, you know, compromise some of that ultra portability for it to be something that can be, you know, instantaneous. Yeah. And of course, you've also got the whole app ecosystem on your side if you're using a mobile device, which you don't necessarily have on a bigger camera. But mm-hmm. one of the things that I've always wondered with uh, people doing the kind of thing you're doing um, is, you know, I remember I ha- I've got a box somewhere in my house, um, which has got things like a Fostex, um, which was, you know, you put an iPhone in it, uh, iPhone 4, and it was perfect size, very snug. And of course, the iPhone 5 comes out, so, you know, different connection, different size, mm-hmm. in the box, useless. Um, how do you deal with the fact that you have, you know, these phones changing different sizes and maybe somebody wants to use a, an Android device? How do you cope with the different sizes and the fact that you can, if you build something too specific to a specific size phone, the next one may come out or, or iPad, whatever, Mm-hmm. And it doesn't work. It doesn't fit anymore. Well, it, it, there's two answers to that. The in the iPad space, you know, our our system is an aluminum frame and a urethane insert. So, what we've done is we've just gone back and and adjusted the insert sizes, um, which is a relatively minor um, you know adjustment to make. The biggest one was from the iPad, you know, two, three, and four to the iPad Air um, one and two and pro 9.7 which are essentially the same insert um the things that are different about them are the the lens position so if we design a a different lens bracket um what we can do there is you know just go in and move the center of that lens hole on our bracket you know the eighth of an inch that apple has moved their lens and accommodate so that's minor for us it's not like having to go back to the drawing board completely uh, because the frame stays the same in, in the phone space it was very interesting because our first our foray into the into iphones was to make a form fit case um which exa- had the exact problem that you're speaking of and um it was you know i i said i don't want to make something that you have to take your phone out of your favorite case to use i want our thing to be your favorite case, but also be something that shoots video. And we had something that was really form fit. Um, it had all kinds of features on it and it was, you know, it wasn't, it was bigger than the phone, but not so much bigger that it would not still fit in your pocket. And then it it took so long to develop. We said, you know, by the time we get this thing out, the new model's going to come out, they're just going to change the body style and we're going to be, you know, we're going to have to go back to the drawing board. And so we, we really said we can't do this. We abandoned it for, an iPhone system that we're doing now, which is completely universal. So, you know, not only can it fit any phone from, you know, SE on up through six plus, but it'll fit any seven. It'll fit any Android phone, any windows, any, you know, anything you throw at it, that's iPad mini or smaller. So we went the opposite direction, which is we don't want to have to redesign it every time another model comes out. Now, um, bringing you up to date. Um, I saw you at MojoCon in Dublin and, um, Obviously, you've been doing the whole kind of Kickstarter thing. Um, so tell us about what you're working on now. So where, where is Padcaster at the moment? Well, Padcaster, you know, we, we decided to enter the phone space, and um, we have a product called the Padcaster Verse. And essentially what it is is um, a universal mount system that, you know, can hold it. It's essentially designed for anything 
the size of an iPad mini on down to, like I said, an, an iPhone SE or 5. Um, it's got a very a very large range and a very solid bite. Um, and it also has, um, you know, a, a handle system and mounting system, not totally unlike the, the, the Padcaster uh, product that we have now, but it's made smaller, it's made lighter and it's made specifically, it's really, I'd say 90% for the phone space, but it'll also fit anything, you know, these things that are sort of tweeners like phablets and small tablets and things. But, you know, what we really wanted to do was say, look, you, these Android phones, I mean, you look at a Samsung um, phone, there, there's a, a, a growing ecosystem of apps for them. The optics are incredible, arguably superior to Apple's. Um, there's really, there's no point in ignoring the fact that people want to use the phone they want to use and to make something that only fits one phone. Um, you know, I don't care if it's a dominant, you know, player in the market, people like their phones. And if it doesn't happen to be an Apple phone, then I don't want to, um, you know, kind of leave them without a, a, a solution. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I'm looking forward to, uh, your next, uh, release cause, uh, um, like you say, uh, it sort of ticks a lot of boxes with stuff I'm really interested in. Now, um, you must, obviously you get feedback from people using your stuff. Can you think of, you know, an example or two of where you've got a real kick out of seeing how people have used it? Um, well, that first, you know, SUNY Stony Brook, the journalism school using it um, as this sort of, you know, replacement for a satellite truck completely blew my mind. I mean, I had no I had no idea you could do that. So I got involved with them um, when I when I heard of them and said, I, how a how can I help and B, tell me what you're doing? I had, you know, at the time, I, I really didn't even understand it. Um, so that was really eye opening, and um, they have since done some other things. They did a, uh, they do a, an event with Alan Alda, who's an actor. He was in the TV show Mash for many, many yeah, years. Yeah, re remember him. Yeah. Um, but he's also into science, and he started a center at that school. And every year, he does something for children to explain a concept so that it can be understood by a child. And he has a wall of screens to communicate with kids in, in seven different countries. And the, I guess last year he did it, he was really dissatisfied with the communication system. And so the head of the school said, you know, we're using these iPads and this, uh, this product Padcaster. I'll bet we could Skype everybody in and just mount seven iPads on the wall. And so they put seven Padcasters on the wall. And that's and and the one that Alan Aldo was addressing at one time went to a bigger screen, but they were all having that conversation together. And you know, again, I, I you know, hats off to the gentleman out there. His name is Phil Altieri. I mean, he's been doing stuff with it that really pushes um, pushes the envelope. So you know, those were two instances where I, you know, I'm scratching my head saying, you know, wow, I, I'm I'm learning from my customers, you know. Great. Oh, that's a brilliant feeling. And you have, you know, people have uh, noticed, um, and I'm right in saying you appeared in an Apple commercial, is that right? I think I'm allowed to say that it wasn't not me. <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. So, they won't throw you over the waterfall, yeah. I know. Uh, so, exactly. yeah, what can you say about that then? Um, I can say it was a really interesting, um, you know, it was it was a unique, completely unique experience. Um, and... Uh, you know, it's it's. I still can't. I can't say how. I have no idea how they got wind of it or what happened. But you know, the idea that someone said this this product is something that um, you know enhances our product. And they go, it's just sort of a nice fit, and we wanted to feature that. And um, you know, it was it was a very kind of humbling and exciting. You know, the whole thing was like completely surreal. I'm still not sure it happened to me. Yeah. Well, great. I mean, it sounds like you. Um... Like I say, if you're making waves and they're noticing, you're obviously doing something right. Now, you're still doing this. Um, so it suggests that what we've got on our hands isn't some kind of fad. Um, and more and more people are, you know, using their mobile devices to create stuff. Where do you think we are, like, in an, as an industry or, a, you know, a movement creating content using mobile devices? You know, is this the beginning? Is it something that's kind of peaking? Uh, where do you see it? Well, I definitely think it's in the beginning. Um, you know, I'm not sure you know, how it can, I'm not sure where it goes and where you would define its peak, but, you know, I think what we'll see is rather than an article saying, you know, hey, look at this film that was shot on an iPhone that, you know, was at Sundance and got bought, um, you know, and is, you know, this great film that you'd never notice was shot on a phone. And then there are these festivals that are mobile phone or iPhone film festivals. I just think 
it'll just become part of you know the language like anything else i mean when when people were shooting digital right and shooting on pal video i remember the celebration came out right i think that was the it was um Vinterberg, I think, made it. It was a, you know, there's a big dogma movement in the 90s that was half of a joke, but half of a serious discipline with Lars von Trier and some other filmmakers. And they were shooting on very low end, you know, standard definition mini DV. And that became part of the, you know, the language. So, you know, I think as these phones improve in quality and, you know, I should say phones now shoot four times as good quality at least as those cameras those films were shot on so they're already ahead of the game i think people are going to find that the statements they can make are more personal you know if it happens to be the right tool for the job they have it in their pocket you know and and i'm not saying a phone or a pad is always going to be the right tool for the job um but if and when it is for people who might not otherwise be able to say what they want to say or find a level of intimacy that lends itself to that kind of format, you know, it's there for them. And I think, you know, certainly with the, all of the improvements in all of these devices, you're seeing that, you know, obviously these, these you know, manufacturers are responding to that too. So um, I think if it, if it makes more people get out there and create more power to it, but I certainly don't think it's peaked. I think it's barely started. And um, I mean, if you were going to make a, a movie n- next week, um, would you still shoot on conventional sort of film cameras or w- are you so sold by this that you would be uh, whipping out your phone? Well, I'm going to shoot something on it tomorrow. Okay. I'm actually in the middle of shooting a, um, a it's a parody of a Hamilton song um, from that show. And um, it's a political song about the election. And we knew we needed to be out there shooting without a lot of attention. And so I said, well, how do you feel about shooting on the phone? And the guy who wrote it said, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, um, you know, I have a channel, a YouTube channel that my friends and I started. And the, 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 uh, we made a bunch of videos. And it seems like the more money we spend and the, more, the better the cameras we use and the, the worse they perform. And the only two that have gone viral are the ones that were shot on an iPad mini and on uh, seven iPhones at once. So <laughs> it seems like, you know, there's no point in not shooting on one. Um, although I will tell you if it's something, you know, like our Kickstarter video was not shot on a mobile device. Mm-hmm. The actual video itself was shot on a different camera because we didn't know what the situations would be at any time. We could be, you know, fighting light. We could, there were so many curveballs that we said, let's take the phone, let's take another camera. In this case, I think it was the Sony a7S. Um, and then see what obstacles put the you know are presented and what the best format is. It turned out the Sony was a better camera for that particular piece. So, um, you know, I'm uh, I, I'm I'm not uh, devout. I, I would say anything that gets the job done, I'm for. Yeah. Now, beginning to wrap up now. Um, you know, saw so you at MojoCon. You're surrounded by you know other people with other devices, other apps, and everything. Um, you know that must obviously give you a bit of encouragement to feel that you're uh, you're not out there on your own doing this kind of stuff. Uh, where do you see you know the next sort of four or five years going? Well, um, probably in the same direction it's been going in the last two or three. I mean, you saw that MojoCon was a much bigger show this year than it was even last year, and I see that that just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger as more people really embrace this technology. So, I mean, I think. You know, I also see because how much education has responded to the podcaster, I see it as such an incredible learning tool, not just to commit to mobile, but to understand the concepts that really cross over that aren't technology specific at all. Because you can learn about filmmaking by learning on a phone or an iPad. Because shot selection and rule of thirds and lighting and sound, all these things are their disciplines don't care if you're using a thirty five millimeter camera or a phone or a Canon Vixia that it, it, you know, so I, that's why I think it's a great, great tool because of the reason that back in 92, it's disposable. If you f- screw up, I was going to say a bad word. I'm glad I didn't. But if, you know, if you make a mistake, the worst it is, the worst consequence for it isn't that you've spent hundreds of dollars on film that you can't afford to replace. You've swiped to the, you know, to the right and it deletes and you start over. And to me, that's that the reason that I think it has such legs is because, it's a great it's a great learning tool that can lead to you know a digital future an analog future or wherever but you know i, I love the sketch pad nature of 
you know, making film or learning film this way. And I think that's, that's here to stay. Great. Well, um, before you go, if somebody is interested in both, obviously, Padcasters products and yourself, uh, where do they go? Well, let's see. You can go to padcaster.com to see what we're doing on the production front. Um, and uh, let's see. We've got all kinds of videos and images of that sort of stuff there. And then, you know, the school that I, I still run is Manhattan Edit Workshop. And um, we're going to start offering more classes in mobile journalism, mobile filmmaking. So we're going to see the two companies sort of relate to one another more in the future, but that's muShop.com. And, uh, you know, me, I mean, <laughs> that is me. I don't have a personal channel, but, um, you know, there's, you are a podcaster now. You've I, been, uh, I've been morphed into it. Yeah. I have an aluminum like frame. I, and, uh, <laughs> I walk around. And what was your uh, YouTube channel you mentioned? Um, well, it's a little cheeky, but it's called Cringe Factory, and um, it's uh, it's on YouTube. We're uh, you know, like I said, we have two videos that performed rather well. Um, one that was shot on the subway with about seven iPhone. I think they were fours at the time. I don't even think iPhone five had come out. Um, and then another that was shot on i on an iPad Mini. Um, in a podcaster a few years ago. So we're still working. This Hamilton thing is also going to fall into the cringe factory banner. And um, it's playfully offensive, I guess is the best way to put it. So hopefully if anyone is listening here and goes there and says, wow, that was, that hurt my feelings. We didn't mean it. Okay, great. Well, like I said, I've, I've been uh, one of your backers and I know you've got some uh, um, exciting sort of improvements in the pipeline and everything so look forward to that and wish you every success in the future and thank you for your time thank you so much for having me it was really fun if you like this podcast don't forget to subscribe and we'd love it if you would leave a review on itunes or stitcher to get in touch with mark go to www.purplebridgemedia.com or tweet him at mark egan video